praise the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Also, I'm going to say peace to everybody that's on the internet and, and listening on the line as well, wherever you at. And we're going to deal with a real basic lesson today because uh, even some of the most basic things are misunderstood nowadays. Because the Lord said in the last days, people will turn away their ears from the truth. And that's exactly the way it is. So some of the simplest things are misunderstood. And today we're going to talk about how God has order. Basically in his church, in the way he operates, period. God has order in everything. It's order God is an awesome God. He got order in this whole creation. The way he created everything, it's in perfect order. That's what lets you know what people say ab about God didn't create it. It was a big bang and stuff just came together like this is, is ludicrous. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Because you don't, you don't do nothing out of total chaos and get total order. That's like saying I can take all this stuff up here on this podium and just start throwing it around and it's going to be in some perfect order when it lands on the ground or on your head. But that's what they say. It was, you know, some people have said it was an explosion, some type of explosion, a big bang, and this is how we got here. But no, we know better. God tell you in the scripture, he did it all. He tell you even... What he said when he did it, he tell you that he told, he put the sand there to keep the water from overrunning it. And said, well, you see this sand water, you let your proud waves be stopped right here. He told you he put the sun and the moon out there to be lights by day and by night. He even let you know it's ordered with that, that the sun is the greater light and the moon is the lesser light. So it's ordered with everything. Same thing when it comes to the word of God. And most people don't want to recognize the order that God has. So we're going to start off in our Romans, the second chapter. And the title is Order in the Body of Servants. Order in the Body of Servants. Because that's something that we should keep in mind to recognize all the order that God has. Whatever it may be. In any area, we should keep in mind that we are only supposed to be servants. Because that's how stuff get out of order. People forget their place. Forget what their job or their responsibility is. So that's how things get out of whack and out of order. So if we keep that in mind, that we're not nobody, we're only supposed to be servants, then we can, we can stay in in line with God's ordained order. Even if somebody else is out of line, the old saying is true, two wrongs don't make a right. So if somebody else is out of line, that don't give us no right to, to get out of order. And that's what happened in a lot of cases. But we're going to start off here in Romans, the second chapter, because this is real basic, but again, the average person don't know it. Romans 2 and verse 6, just to show you even when it comes to God choosing his people Israel, that is still the order to this day. Order in the body of servants. Romans 2 and verse 6. Go ahead. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Okay, so first of all, we just jumped in here kind of, but he says who will render to every man according to his deeds. So that's how God is. So... God set things up the way he wanted, and he might have somebody in front of you, but that's, that doesn't mean that God is a respecter of persons and is going to accept them in front of you in spite of what they do. So that's what he's stressing because he was preaching to the Romans here, Paul was, but he was letting, letting it be known that just because they were not Jews. They fell, in, they fell in line with the order. They came last when it comes to receiving the word, but they still had 
an opportunity, and that's all that matters, and it's, like, it's not like God is unfair. So that's why we just jumped in here, Romans 2 and 6. He said, who will render to every man according to his deeds? So it don't matter who you are, no matter what your status quo is, no matter what your position is, God is going to render to you according to your deeds. But now, with that said, we're going to find out it's still order with how God do things. Go ahead, verse 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, see, eternal life. See now, if you one that's wise, that's patient and continuance in well-doing, and you seek for glory and honor and immortality, then that's what you're going to get. He said eternal life. But on the other hand, because God is fair. He got order, but he's fair. God created everything. He can do things how he wants to do it. Some people have a problem with God's order sometimes. Even when it comes to men and women, sometimes women want to think they should be like the man. Even when it comes to what we're starting off with talking here with the church. In the world, they made, they made it seem as if God don't care about Israel no more and basically it's anybody or the Gentiles that took over the church. No, that is not the case. God didn't set it up that way, and God don't change. But yet and still, if somebody don't do what they're supposed to do, don't matter who they are, God going to deal with them. So he said to them, who by patient continues and well doing, seek for glory and honor and them one child, they're going to get eternal life. But on the other hand, what? Verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, Upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Oh, now he said, but on the other hand, if you are contentious and don't obey the truth, don't matter who you are, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath is what you got coming. And he adds some more to that. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. So God don't care who you are. But now notice the order that he lay out still in this. Now this is the New Testament. People say the Jews don't matter, Israel done away with. But what does Paul say at the end of verse 9? All that, start at 9 again, matter of fact. Go ahead. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Uh -huh. Of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. Oh, see it's still order with God, isn't it? All that being said, no, he's not a respecter person. He's going to render to every man according to his deed. But God still has the order. The, and it's the same original order that he started from the beginning. Because God started with Israel. Jew just became short for Israel because all the other tribes were basically in slavery at this time. So everybody left were called Jews because they were surrounded and located mainly in the tribe of Judah. So everybody left were called Jews. But it's synonymous with Israel. Period. That's who God started with. He didn't start with Judah. He started with Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Judah was one of his sons. So that's who he started with, and that cannot be changed to this day. And people don't understand that. You tell them Israel is God's church to this day, they don't understand it. They don't believe it. They believe anything but that. You tell them Catholic or Methodist or Baptist is God's church, they nod their head up, huh? right? But you say something about Israel, they look dumbfounded. Or the Jew. Because the common theory is who the Jews are, period, don't matter. We know it's a misconception who they are, who they are but whoever they would be, they come first according to this, right? Mm -hmm. Even when it comes to getting the bad stuff. That's why we didn't got more bad stuff than anybody, because we the real Jews. Notice he said, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. And this is taking you all the way down to the end of time. And this is in Romans, the second chapter. So if you say you're a New Testament Christian, you still can't think that Israel don't matter or the Jew don't matter when he's telling you here, that's, that's the order. The Jew first, even down to Judgment Day. The Jew first and also of the Gentile. See, this is order that God got that people don't want to accept, though. 
Paul is telling you, Jesus, when he came, he said he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel, and that's all he went looking for. He worried about the Gentiles later. It ain't like he excluded the Gentiles, but he got ordered. That's what he just said here, right? Read verse 10. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, uh -huh. to the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. Now, when the, good, when the good reward passed out, get passed out, even in the end, even when you get eternal life, God is going to do that according to some order, isn't it? He said, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. See, so some, some people have a problem, but it shouldn't matter. Long, only thing you got to worry about is doing what you need to do to please God and get your reward when the time comes. Everybody, obviously he had to deal with somebody first. He chose to deal with Israel first. That's the order. But it ain't like Israel got a special seat automatically in the kingdom. They just got the first shot at doing what they supposed to do. And, and if they don't do what they supposed to do, they're not going to make it. And anybody from another nationality do what God want them to do, that he's showing Israel, they are going to make it. And we, we got a lot of Israelites to this day don't understand this. I thought they was extinct. Until I got on, saw, seen a bunch of them online, I said, they still around. They trying to kill all the Gentiles. They say, and they be trying to read the New Testament to kill all the Gentiles. That's what's amazing to me. And they try to say stuff, you know, when you see Gentiles or when you see strangers, that's really referring to Israel because Israel got lost. Well, I know Israel got lost. And we became strangers to ourselves, but yet and still you got legitimate scripture referring to other nationalities besides Israel that's coming in. And they said, no, nah, uh-uh. I was arguing with some people not too long ago. Well, I just kind of listened to the argument, but that's what they were saying. All the Gentiles in trouble, they're going to hell. Or some Israelites. So this is some of the stuff Paul was debating with right here. That's why he's stressing this. He's still showing you his order, but yet and still he's showing you that everybody got access. And he's telling the Romans this. So verse 10, he said, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Why? What else again at verse 11? For there is no respect of persons with God. See, there still is no respect of person with God. He going to give everybody what they got coming, but it is order to it. Now let's go to Numbers 1. We're going to go back, show you everything is airtight with the Lord. Numbers, all the way back to the Old Testament. Numbers 1. Because the Gentiles do have to accept that God started with Israel. And he worked everything around Israel. Gentiles have to accept that because that's his order. That's why the whole Bible is speaking to Israel. The only other people that hear from God, they hear from God through Israel. Even when the Gentiles came into the fold, they came into what God was setting up with Israel. Obviously so, because Jesus said he wasn't sent to nobody but Israel. So all the people Jesus was ministering to and healing and, and building his church up with or rebuilding it up was nothing but Israelites. Then later on, he sent Paul to all the Gentiles and they got added to it. But see, that's a misconception in this world. You got the man in Rome making you think the Gentiles run the church now. How? Not in the Bible. He just said the Jew first, then the Gentile. And that takes you all the way to the end. Numbers 1 and verse 1. Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, uh -huh. on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying. Okay, now look. This is who God was dealing with. He started with Israel, and according to Paul, he finished him with Israel. This is when he first set Israel up as his people, as his church. He had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but this is when he started putting the promises into action, once they had grew into a people. So he brought them out of Egypt, and he took them out where he can straighten them out 
all by themselves in the wilderness, even though there's other people with them, but he dealing specifically with them. So it said, and the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. So he's, that's, this is where the Lord set Israel up and showed them everything that it required to please him in the wilderness. And guess what? He's going to do the exact same thing again because God don't change. He's going to do it one final time. He's going to take us to the desert. Because like I tell people all the time, we're not fit for nothing right now. We want to talk a big game, but we ain't fit for nothing right now. If the Gentiles say, here, here go the keys. Y'all run everything. We're running the ground quicker than them. So he's going to do that all over again. And the Bible show you that. But he said, he talked to Moses. When they first came out of Egypt, and he's setting them up. See, this is what God's going to do again. We don't even know where we're from, what tribe we're from, or none of that. But he's going to put us back in order when he come back again. Like he was doing right here. What did he say? Verse 2. Take you the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel uh -huh. after their families, by the house of their fathers, uh -huh. with the number of their names, every male by their pole. Okay, so now he said, look, I want you to number the males. By their post, because that's the order with God. God deal with the males. He deal with the males first. That's the order that he set up. So he said, take the males by their post. He didn't say nothing about the females, but go ahead, verse 3. From 20 years old and upward, uh -huh. all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, uh -huh. thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Uh -huh. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his father. Okay, so now he said we're going to number them. And also with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his father. See, God is setting the order up in Israel at this time. And he is going to have to do this all over again. Go ahead, verse 5. And these are the names of the men that shall stand with you, of the tribe of Reuben, Elijah, the son of Sedator. Okay, so now he, he starts setting them up by the names, each one from a tribe that's going to be with Moses and Aaron, but we're not going to read all their names, but we know it's 12 tribes. This is an important order that God had, has established. Even down, we're not going to read down to Revelation 22 where New Jerusalem was coming down and that's the city that everybody that's saved is going to have to get into and it's going to have 12 gates after the 12 tribes of Israel. So he had a head of each one of these tribes with Moses. With Moses. Skip down to verse 44 and read that. Go ahead. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered. And the princes of Israel being 12 men, each one was for the house of his father. See, Moses... The Lord had Moses put all this in order. And he had one prince over Israel at this time, way back here. One prince over Israel, being 12, because it's 12 tribes of Israel. One prince over each tribe. He said, being 12 men, each one was for the house of his father. And we could have read their names, we're just going to skip over. Now we're just going to show you that God's order don't change. Go to the New Testament, Luke 22, because the whole Bible go together. Some people kick against Jesus, but Jesus was in line with everything that was set up in the old days. What no coincidence that he came and had exactly 12 apostles, and even when one messed up and committed suicide, because that's what Judas did, he, they replaced him. They still had 12. And Jesus knew that all the time. But they had 12. No coincidence. Luke 22 now. See, this is little stuff that must mean something because it's all in order. We see that it's the Jew first, so we need to look at the foundation that God set with Israel. Luke 22 and verse 24. Luke 22 and verse 24. But the reason why we get out of order and don't want to go along with the order that God has set up God is a God of order. The reason why we get out of line because we forget we're supposed to be servants. That's all we're supposed to have the mind set up. But a lot of times we get puffed up in the mind and forget that we're going to turn to dust very shortly. 
Luke 22 and verse 24. Go ahead. And there was also a strife among them. Uh huh. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Okay, now even these brothers hanging out with Jesus, there was 12 of them. But even they was forgetting what they supposed to be about. God, he got the order set up. Even a couple of the disciples, they, they went to Jesus. I think their mother kind of initiated it. But they went to Jesus saying, look, we want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand in the kingdom. That's what we want. But Jesus said, no, that ain't, that's for who it's given to. See, we want to be, we always want to be something that wasn't given to us to be. Even they was thinking like that. And they got their position in the body already that the Lord gave them. That's one thing you don't have to worry about. Whatever the Lord wants you to do, whatever position he wants you in, can't nobody stop you from being there or doing it. Can't nobody stop that. But you ain't got to be trying to be something that the Lord didn't intend for you to be. That's where you're going to get out of order. Mm -hmm. So they came. Now the disciples, the 12 disciples who've been hanging out with Jesus, they came and was arguing among themselves, saying, who is the greatest? That's where it said, verse 24, Luke 22. And there was also strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? So they arguing about who the greatest. Go ahead. Let's see what the master said. Verse 25. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Uh-huh. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Uh-huh. He said, look, y'all caught up in the ways of the Gentiles. They get caught up in having authority and being somebody great. He said, y'all supposed to have a different mindset. That's why the title is the order in the body of what? Servants. You got to have a servant mentality to be useful to God in the first place. Because you ain't nobody. But go ahead. But you shall not be so. Uh -huh. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief as, as he that doth serve. He said, look, don't be like the ways of the world. Don't be like the Gentiles. You should not be so. He that is greatest among you, let him be as younger. Let him be... He that is chief as he that serves. He said, this is the mentality you need to have because that's who's going to be great. God is dishing out what, which, what rewards you're going to get anyway. You can't tell God what you want. Go ahead, 27. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. Uh -huh. Is not he that sitteth at meat, uh -huh. but I am among you as he that serveth. See, he telling you what, it's, what you supposed to, the mindset you supposed to have now. Not trying to obtain a high position and be great. The way you going to be great and be what you supposed to be is to be a servant now. So he said, whether it's greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? Yeah, that's the greater position. But he said, well, look, I'm showing you something that that ain't what it's about because, but I am among you as he that serveth. So now if Jesus, who was God in the beginning, can be among man as he that served, what you think man's supposed to be? Servant. Go ahead, 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptation. Now he gonna tell them what they had coming since they so thirsty. He said, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Go ahead. And I appoint unto you a kingdom uh -huh. as my father hath appointed unto me. He said, this is what you got coming. You want to know what position y'all going to have. You trying to talk about who the greatest. He really telling them they all on the same plane. Ye, but y'all have continued with me in my temptations and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. That what? That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And he said, look, this is what you're going to get. You're going to be able to eat and drink with me at my table in my kingdom. Go ahead. And sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. No wonder he had 12 disciples, huh? And no wonder even though Judas messed up, they replaced him. So he, he let them know what they had coming and to just be a servant so they can get it, right? Judas obviously forgot that. He 
started worrying about serving only himself. Well, he was always worried about that, according to the scriptures. But he was letting them know, if you keep in mind what your job is, to serve, I appoint unto your kingdom, as my father appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it, he already had it set where they was going to be. There wasn't no need for them to be buffering and arguing and jockeying for a position because that's what they were starting to do. And there ain't no need for us to do that because God is the one set the order. You just got to serve your way into your position. But notice, he said, you're going to sit on 12 thrones. You're going to sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So just like Moses had 12 heads with him, because Jesus is that prophet like unto Moses, according to uh, Deuteronomy, I think it's the 18th chapter. And that's why they had the same thing. Even Moses has 70 men who the Lord put the spirit on later on. Jesus has 70 as well. But right here, we're just dealing with the 12 to show you that God's order is totally intact. But now let's go further. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 2. Because everything started with Israel. Israel is the foundation, and you cannot erase that. People won't erase that nowadays because they don't have no understanding of the scriptures. They don't even want to talk about Israel. They think Israel don't matter. Look, even if I wasn't Israel, I couldn't get away from the importance of Israel all over this Bible. And that's the way anybody should look at it. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. Well, people got things twisted now because Israel, rightly so, we messed up and went into bondage. So people have been going for what they know. But that's going to have to change. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10. Go ahead. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamely we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Okay, now Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, which are Gentiles. See, again, I know some brothers and sisters that say, look, everywhere where they talk about Gentiles, that's really what's referring to Israel because they was among the Gentiles. Now he's talking to real Gentiles. So here he's talking to the Thessalonians, not the Israelites among the Thessalonians. No, he's talking to the true-blooded Thessalonians. He said, they witnesses how holy and justly and unblamely they behave themselves, talking about the Israelites, Paul and his companions, among them. Go ahead, verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you uh -huh. as a father doth his children. Go ahead. That ye will walk worthy of God. Uh -huh. who have called you into his kingdom and glory. Okay, now, a lot of people don't get that, that you got to do something. You got to walk worthy of God. That's what he said when they charged the Thessalonians. He said, we charged you, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you just like a father charged his children that you do what you're supposed to do. He said, walk worthy of God. People say, well, you ain't got to do nothing. What do walk worthy mean? God can call you, but you got to walk worthy of that calling. That ye would walk worthy of God who have called you unto his kingdom and glory. Verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Uh -huh. Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, uh -huh. ye received it not as the word of men, uh -huh. but as it is in truth. The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He said, y'all believed it. He said, we thanking God, because when y'all heard it, y'all accepted it. And knew it was the truth. Go ahead. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Oh, uh, so he didn't say that everybody followed Rome, did he? Mm -hmm. See, how did that change? See, I, that, I guess that's why the man in Rome, he going to realize he in the wrong place, so eventually he going to move to Jerusalem. But that's going to be his last move. But he, he even going to have enough sense to know, look, the seat is not in Rome. I've been sitting at the wrong place. Because the seat is in Jerusalem. But woe unto him when he sit in that seat. But notice what Paul told the Thessalonians. 
He said, for ye brethren became followers. The Thessalonians now became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Because everything is centered around Israel. That's where the church is headquartered at. Everything started with Israel. He brought Israel out of Egypt and set them up. Then when they messed up, Jesus came to reestablish things. And he didn't reestablish it with nobody else but Israel. So much so, he told one lady, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. She was begging and crying. He finally took care of her. But at first, he let her know the order, though. So everybody else got to come this way. God give it to Israel. Everybody else got to come that way. The Thessalonians had done it. He said, for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. He stressed the ones in Christ, in Christ Jesus, because you can have plenty of Israelite congregations and churches, all of them not in the truth. Then he said something else, finish 14. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, uh -huh. even as they have of the Jews. Oh, that lets you know these were true Thessalonians. He said, for ye, these Thessalonians, you suffer like things of your own countrymen. The Thessalonians, who didn't believe, even as they have of the Jews. Just like the Israelites, who was preaching the truth, suffered from the Israelites who didn't believe. Same thing go on to this day, but go ahead, 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus. See, that's what Israel did. Go ahead. And their own prophets uh -huh. and have persecuted us. Uh -huh. And they please not God uh -huh. and are contrary to all men. Uh -huh. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Oh, see, Paul was literally speaking to Gentiles. He wasn't speaking to Israelites who had became like Gentiles. Matter of fact, he said these Israelites forbid us to speak to the Gentiles. And we get the same thing to this day. Like I said, I thought all these Israelites was extinct. Who was putting, trying to put all the Gentiles in hell? Saying they wasn't, they didn't have, they don't have no part. Too many scriptures tell you that. Isaiah 56 tells you the son of the stranger that joined himself to the Lord to serve him, he's gonna be accepted. Matter of fact, he'll have a better name than an Israelite mm -hmm. that don't do what he's supposed to do. Jesus told you that. He said, it's gonna be many from the east, west, north, and south. They're gonna come and sit down in the kingdom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think it's Matthew 8. And the children of the kingdom are gonna get cast out. Because God is no respecter of persons. Though he does have order, he's no respecter of persons. So Paul said, the Israelites, you've been suffering from your people just like the true servants of God been suffering from, in Israel, been suffering from the other Israelites. Because who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophet persecute us. They don't please God. They're contrary to all men. Verse 16, he said, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. So Paul and the other apostles who understood was being forbidden by the Israelites who didn't understand. Forbidden to speak to the Gentiles. And we get the same thing to this day. Forbidden us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. What? To fill up their sin always. To, to just continue to sin. Go ahead. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Go ahead. But now we, to 2 Thessalonians now. 2 Thessalonians. That's good. 2 Thessalonians 3. So, so we see how the order go even in this matter. When it comes to getting saved, God give it all to Israel. That's the foundation that he didn't set with Israel. And everybody else had to become followers of that, just like he showed the Thessalonians. Paul told the same thing to the Ephesians. He said, now you have become part of the commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians 2. We ain't going to read that. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians Three, because we're just touching on different areas, showing the order in the body of servants. That's what it's about, being a servant, though. Second Thessalonians 3 and 6. 3 and 6. Go ahead. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye would withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, mm -hmm. and not after the tradition which he received of us. Uh-huh. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. Uh -huh. for, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. See, order is important. Because if you don't have no order, you, the opposite of that is just going to be total chaos. You're going to have chaos. 
So you got to have order. It got to be some type of foundation laid that everybody need to follow. But some people don't care what the foundation is. They just want to do things their way. Well, those are the ones that's disorderly. So he even mentioned some here, which will let you know that we will have some disorderly among us. What did he say? Verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. So he's letting the Thessalonians know, look, you're going to have some disorderly folks among you. you. You get away from them. And not after the tradition which he received from us. Because Paul showed them how they were supposed to be living. It's just like we stressing and dealing with the law and being obedient to God. If somebody coming against that, they ain't coming against us. They coming against the order that God has laid down. So he went further and said, verse 7, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Paul said, we didn't behave ourselves disorderly. Go ahead, verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, uh -huh. but wrought with labor and travail night and day, uh -huh. that we might not be chargeable to any of you. He said, we didn't eat no man's bread for nothing, and we labored night and day that we wouldn't owe you be chargeable to nobody. See, that's what being a servant is about. That's why we're not like a lot of these preachers stressing, trying to get money and get rich ourselves, because we know that don't amount to nothing. So we laboring as well. Go ahead, verse 9. Not because we have not power. Not because we don't have power, because the Bible say the workman is worthy of his hire. The Bible say don't muzzle the ox that treaded the corn. But it's good to be an example, especially when you don't have many examples. Go ahead. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Uh-huh. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, uh -huh. working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. See, so he's letting it be now, look, in everything it needs to be some order. And he was dealing with some stuff he had heard about them, that some was being busybodies and disorderly, because obviously what he's saying, they got too much time on their hands. They need to be working, taking care of some business. He said, we hear that some which walk among you are disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them which are such we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Verse 13. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Uh -huh. And if any man obey not the, our word by his epistle, note that, note that man, and have no company with him, uh -huh. that he may be ashamed. See, see, it's even a way to enforce, to keep things in order when people are getting out of order. Because people will get out of order. Paul is talking about some people getting out of order. Don't want to acknowledge no kind of order. Think it should be how they want it to be. He said, if, if any don't obey our word by this epistle, which is a letter, he said he, he wants them to note that man and don't even keep company with him that he can be ashamed. Therefore, he can straighten up unless he done went too far. But go ahead, 15. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as, as, admonish him as a brother. See, that's somebody that still that maybe just don't understand. But sometimes people don't care to understand, and that's a whole other way to handle them. But we'll get to it. Acts 20 now. So we see that from the, from the foundation, God got order, and there's always somebody willing to go against what God has. Acts 20, and we're going to pick it up at verse 25. Acts 20. In verse 25. Acts 20. And verse 25. Okay, go ahead. And now behold, I know that ye all, 
among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Uh -huh. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Uh -huh. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Uh -huh. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay, now Paul is basically giving a farewell speech here. Saying he wasn't going to see these people no more who he'd been preaching to. He said, I done showed you the word. I haven't held nothing back. I done showed you everything you need to know. And even to the leaders, because it got to be somebody in charge running stuff. So he said at verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers. See, so it got to be somebody overseeing. That's just that's just a fact of order. It got to be somebody overseeing. Because that's the way God have things set up. That's why Jesus, when he came, he had 12 apostles. And he told them even that long-term position would be to sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's always order. Sometimes people have a problem with any type of order or authority. But he said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. See, now Paul knew. He said, look, when I leave, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Who would, who would do this? Somebody who's not thinking about serving. They thinking about being served. They thinking about getting over. They thinking about their own self. Go ahead, verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. See, that happens a lot. See, but you, you, you should be able to recognize that because you have to see what somebody's agenda really is. Is it to serve or to be served? according to what we've been reading so far. God got order from the get-go. But where you fit in there is what has to be known. So he said, for I know this, that after my departing grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. See, I've seen this over and over and over again, and it's easy to be seen because if somebody, just like when I was at the church in Chicago, the Israel of God, it's seen countless people leave. And they start talking crazy, and they leave. Well, I knew right off, hey, that, that, that was out of order. Because, hey, you done been here, and you done learned so much, now you smarter than everybody else. Don't nobody else know nothing, and you're going to run off talking about everybody else. You know, but they say, well, I'm going to start another congregation. But they, they agenda was what he said here. At verse, uh, what verse was that? Verse 30. Verse 30, he said, also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So that was their goal. They were speaking some perverse stuff. They goal wasn't to just go save some souls. Like they had been there long enough to get their souls saved. That's why I knew when I left the Israel of God, I better not be trying to come against where I learned how to save myself. Why would I come against that? I learned how to save myself there. I was thankful for that. So that's why I was real cautious how I handled that. That's why I didn't run off and start cursing people out. Hey, I waited six months before I left. I gave them six months notice. Because, hey, I learned how to save myself. Even if I had some disagreement, I knew it wouldn't have been nothing compared to learning how to get salvation and other people being saved. But see, that's only people do that who don't understand the order that God has established. Just like I know brothers that they ran off. Now, they know everything, so they think, and they elders who they was under, who got them started, don't know nothing. Something wrong with that. If you was under these people, how, you don't know nothing then. If they don't know nothing, unless you done got a whole nother foundation from somewhere else, but you ain't showing that. 
unless the Lord had came down personally and been teaching you, which is not the case because you're still trying to deal with half of what you got from them. But on the other hand, you, you speaking some perverse stuff. This is what he's saying here. See, but we have to recognize that when stuff is out of order like that. Paul said here, also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things. Paul said this, so he understood how the game went. Speaking perverse things, and their only purpose was to draw away disciples after themselves. They trying to be somebody, so they not trying to serve body. They trying to be somebody great, which is not what the mission should be. See, that's why I always base what I was doing, when the Lord showed me it was time to start preaching on my own, it wasn't about what somebody else had did. How you going to say your mission is to go preach based on somebody else not doing right? Hmm. They could be wrong. It's two left shoes. That don't mean you got a call to do nothing. But that's what a lot of people do. Oh, they ain't got it right over there. I'm going to go start me a church. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. You got the wrong idea. But go ahead, 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. See, he said, look, you better pay attention to this. He said, I've been warning people. He said, by the space of three years I just didn't cease to warn you night and day with tears. Go ahead. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Uh-huh. I have co coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. See, Paul said, hey, we ain't come here to be served. We, come, we came to serve. So that's evident. He said, I didn't covet no man's silver or gold or apparel. Go ahead, 34. Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities mm -hmm. and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, and it is. And that's what you should be looking at. Not trying to get and be served, but trying to give and serve. That's what the mission is supposed to be according to what we've been reading. But now let's go further. Go to... Uh, Back to Numbers 16. Numbers 16. Because see, Paul was saying, he knew some bad stuff was going to happen. Some people was going to start talking crazy. Even he said, he really was pointing the finger at people in the crowd there. He said, even among your own selves, some of y'all going to get up and start talking crazy. See, Paul understood it. Well, that wasn't nothing new, though. You got all kind of examples of that. Here's a good example of that, going back to when God was laying the foundation of his church in the beginning with Israel, through Moses. We saw God was speaking. That shows you, boy, Israel don't respect, don't respect no order. They knew God was speaking to Moses face to face, and they come against him start talking crazy. Even people, like Paul said, among the ones I was supposed to be helping and leading with them. Number 16 and verse 1. Go ahead. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Korthath, Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, Abraham, the son of Eli Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Okay, now he said Korah, which was a Levite. The son of Isai, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and he named some other brothers from Reuben. He said... They took men. In other words, this is exactly what Paul said was going to happen. Some men was going to rise up and start speaking some perverse stuff because they got a, another agenda in their mind. They not trying to just go out and save souls. They trying to be great. Go ahead, verse 2. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, Famous in the congregation, men of renown. Boy, they got a big coup going on. They rose up against Moses with certain men. Certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the sin. So now these are people who got a position already, who got a title, 
who got a job, who got a place in the, in the body. They, in the, they got an order in the body. 250 princes of the assembly, famous, it said, in the congregation, men of renown. <clears throat> Go ahead. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, uh -huh. Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, uh -huh. every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Uh -huh. Therefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the, above the congregation of the Lord. See, you always know something fishy when people come with these generality, general accusations. You ain't really talking about nothing specific. Just, you know, you just ain't doing right. That's basically what they're telling Moses. <clears throat> they said, look, you take too much upon you, Moses, <clears throat> seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now, where would they get that from? Obviously, somebody got to be in the order. Somebody got to be in the chain of command. Somebody got to be at every position. Hey, Moses didn't even want to do what the Lord was sending him to do. The Lord sent Moses to do this. And only way they got where they was at to this point, and even the only way they became famous is because of Moses. Now all of a sudden, Moses is taking too much on himself. Go ahead, verse 4. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Go ahead. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, uh -huh. Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy. Well, they show you that Moses had direct contact with the Lord, boy. Moses came back quick. He said, you know what? Even tomorrow the Lord is going to show who is holy and who is his. We're going to settle this right away. Go ahead. And will cause him to come near unto him. Uh -huh. Even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. He said he's going to prove it. He's going to cause the one he chose to come near. And he didn't tell him right away what he's going to do to the other people, but it wasn't going to be nice. Go ahead. This do, take you senses, Korah, and all his company, uh -huh. and put fire therein, mm -hmm. and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Uh -huh. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. See, Moses turned it back on him. He said, we're going to see tomorrow. We're going to do a little, we're going to seek the Lord. We're going to do a little test. We're going to do a test. So you come out and you bring your senses and, we, and, and we're going to let the Lord prove it to you. And I tell you, he going to choose who is holy and you take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. In other words, he tells them, look, you just stepped out of your place. Hey, this is the place. He didn't do nothing that the Lord hadn't gave him to do. Moses was doing exactly what the Lord gave him to do. But they was getting out of their place. And like I said, I've seen this over and over again. When, I was, when the, we was in a storefront at the Israel of God, it was always brothers rising up trying to say this. And most of the time, they just whispered to people in the crowd. Tell them, oh, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right. But one time, my teacher put them to the test. They were shocked. He said, yeah, I know some of y'all have been saying such and such. He named some brothers, said, come up here and show what y'all got. They was ducking and hiding in. <laughs> one, of, one brother went up there. He's still around to this day because he, he just didn't understand. But he, he meant well. But some of the other ones, they was just playing around. But when it came time to come up and put up, hey, they was ducking and dodging. But now Moses telling them to put up, right? Go ahead, verse 8. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, mm -hmm. seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel have separated you from the congregation of Israel uh -huh. to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord mm -hmm. and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. See, that shows you it's always a mess that go on. These brothers already had a high position, but sometimes we get big-headed and, and where we at is not good enough. That's what you have to be careful of. He said, it seemed, seemed a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the serve. He said, you don't think that's much now. You want more, and the way you want 
the way you're going to get more, you're going to try to put somebody else down. Bring an accusation against somebody. But go ahead. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. Uh huh. And seek ye the priesthood also? He said, now you want the priesthood. You got a position. The Lord then gave you a job to do to serve him, but that ain't good enough for you. Now, you want the priesthood also. See, that's what the problem was. It wasn't the problem was not that Moses did something wrong or Aaron did something wrong. The problem was their aspiration. They wanted to be something the Lord didn't get them to be. And that's where we all fall into that trap if we don't pay attention. Wanting to do something or be something that the Lord didn't give for us to do or be. That's what they was doing. They already had a position in the body, a great position in the body. Probably a lot of other people would have wanted their position. And somebody probably ended up getting it after they fumbled the ball. That's what they did. They made room for some more people that was humble enough to just come in and serve and do a job instead of want to stir up some confusion because their position is not high enough. Just like I've seen brothers over and over, they left the Israel of God and go out and start preaching crazy to try to make like they know something. Even brothers tried to get me to start talking crazy. Say, yeah, see, Bowie don't believe in this uh, just because it ain't in line with his teaching. I say, well, I see why he don't believe in it. It's stupid. It, ain't, it don't line up with the Bible. See, I didn't go out to try to make up something to show I know more than somebody else. I just went out to try to help somebody else hear what I knew. But go ahead. What verse you at? Verse uh, 11. Uh-huh. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. Uh-huh. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? Go ahead. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eli, which said, we would not come up. See, now he called these other brothers who were stirring it up, and they did just like the brothers I knew years ago. They didn't want to even, now they don't want to come up. Look, you came up to start this mess. Let's finish it now. Hmm. No, we ain't going to come up because you ain't right, see. You ain't right. I ain't, I ain't even going to come. Look, you just started it now. Even if you don't come, the Lord going to deal with you where you at. Because you can open a can of worms. But Moses called them. He told some of the other brothers. But then he called them. And they said, we said, we will not come up. Go ahead, 13. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey? See, they still talking. Go ahead. To kill us in the wilderness, uh -huh. except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. See, they just throwing stone. They say, oh, is, is it a small thing? They're going to use Moses' word because he told the other ones it's a small thing at the position you got already. See, people just be gang saying. So they're going to throw his words back on them. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? That show you. they saying they don't believe in none of the stuff that the Lord is doing. They don't believe they're going to make it to the land of milk and honey, which they not for, for, for acting like that. But now you making yourself a prince over us. Verse 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey. Like that was in his control. Go ahead. Or giving us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Uh-huh. Would thou put out the eyes of these men? We would not come up. We not coming up. Go ahead. And Moses was very wrong. Well, Moses was hot then, boy. Because people, when, you know, that's like killing somebody. People, the Lord say you bearing false witness. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't bear false witness on your neighbor. They're accusing him of doing something he ain't doing. He ain't, he ain't there to be served. He only been served. The proof was in the pudding. So, yeah, he was hot. Go ahead, verse 15. And Moses was very wrong uh -huh. and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offer. Uh -huh. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. See, the Lord said, Moses said, Lord, don't respect their offer, because they were going to do an offering and see who the Lord then chose. Don't respect their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Verse 16. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou in all thy company before the Lord, uh -huh. thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. Uh huh. And take every man his censer and put incense in them mm -hmm. and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer. Go two, ahead. 250 censers. Thou also, Aaron, each of you in his censer. Go ahead. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation 
with Moses and Aaron. That's so you can get so big headed and so carried away with your foolishness, you think the Lord on your side now. They actually going to try to test. But they know they had their own agenda, so they didn't fool themselves, in other words. Go ahead. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh -huh. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. See, just because you can persuade some people to follow you and go along with you still don't mean it's right. That don't mean nothing. Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. See, now the whole congregation is messed up. They listening to this mess because, hey, you know, the Lord can be testing you and challenging you, but you still got to believe what his word is saying. Hey, no, they hadn't made it to the promised land yet, but they wasn't fit to go to the promised land yet. They had to get all this mess out the way. They had to get cleaned up. So, you know, that, but they can play on that. See, he ain't did nothing. He ain't took us nowhere. We ain't went nowhere. He got us out here. So they got all of them disgruntled now. Start off a handful of them, now everybody disgruntled. Yeah, that's right, man. That's right. <laughs> that, that Moses, I knew something was wrong with Moses. <laughs> so they all talking crazy now. But they don't respect the order. See, if you know God is, has dealt with somebody or some situation, you should just respect that on, on GP, just like David did with Saul. With, uh, Saul. He knew Saul was anointed king. Saul was trying to chasing David around, trying to kill him, and David wouldn't lift a finger against him. He preferred to run than come up against Saul. Had the opportunity to kill him on a couple of occasions, and he refused to kill him. The only thing he did is let him know he had the opportunity. And he got mad at himself for doing that. One time he was, he was smoking himself. Oh, I shouldn't even did that. That's how humble he was. But he had respect to God's order of, of things. And he knew it was about being a servant. So now, verse 21, read it again. Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in the moment. See, now the Lord mad with the whole congregation. And he said, Moses, y'all move over here. Separate yourself from this congregation, the whole congregation now, that I may consume them in a moment. He said, you just get out the way now. I'm about to handle this right now. Go ahead. We're going to keep reading, even though it ain't on the handout. Go ahead. 22. And they fell upon their faces and said, Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, mm -hmm. shall one man sin and without be wrought with all the congregation? See, they praying for the people. They said, God, one man going to sin, you going to kill them all? Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then the Lord said, okay, I tell you what, you better tell them to get away from them, or else they're going to be dead with them. Go ahead. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. Uh -huh. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Uh -huh. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And uh -huh. Dathan and Abiram came out. And stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. See, and they proud, boy. Go ahead. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, mm -hmm. for I have not done them of my own mind. Uh -huh. If these men die come up common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, uh -huh. then the Lord hath not sent he me. He said, I'm going to prove to you today. I ain't doing this on my own. I'm going to prove it right now today. This is how you going to know. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after visitation of all men, then the Lord have not sent me. Go ahead. But if the Lord make a new thing, mm -hmm. and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertaining to them, uh -huh. and they go down quick into the pit, go ahead. then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Go ahead. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, go that ahead. the ground clave asunder that was under them. Mm -hmm. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertain to Korah, and all their goods. That was the end of that. Just about. Not quite. Go ahead. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Well, that's something, isn't it? 
You get swallowed up. The earth opened up, swallowed you up, and closed back up on you. You was living going down. I, I don't think you lived too long under there. But they was alive and saw that, just like an earthquake. But it was, it was more of a perfect earthquake because it was just for them. Open up, close, close back up over them. Go ahead. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of, of them. Of course they did. They was running out. They really got away from them then, didn't they? Go ahead. For they said, lest the earth swallows up, swallow us up also. Uh-huh. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. See, they wasn't over there. He said a fire came out and burned them up. He didn't forget about them. But that's just an example how you will have some disruption in the order that God has set up. Just like Paul said, among your own selves, people are going to come against what's right. But now, go to uh, let's go back to the New Testament, 3 John, all the way by Revelation. 3 John, it's only one chapter. See, this is, this is all over. I'm talking about real live individuals who want to be out of order. That's what they live for. Even some people might not be intended to be out of order, but they get so caught up in what they thinking and what they want. So they, they, they don't think that it's about serving. They forget that. That it's about serving. It ain't about trying to do your will. First John, a uh, third John 1. Third John 1, right before Revelation and Jude. Third John 1 and 5. It's just one chapter. Verse 5. Go ahead. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, uh -huh. which have borne witness of the charity before the church, uh -huh. whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sword, thou shalt do well. Go ahead. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might, we might be fellowship, fellow helpers of, to the truth. Okay, so now he's preaching to these these brothers, and he said, talking about the ones that went out preaching the gospel for real, because you always got some preaching it for real, and you got some preaching it for show. But he said, verse 7, because that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. They weren't trying to get over themselves, they went forth preaching. Verse 8, he said, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. He said, that's, we, he said, we need to receive them so we can help them. Go ahead, verse 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, uh -huh. who love to have the preeminences of, among them, received us not. See, it's somebody in John's time. He said, look, I wrote unto the church, but this guy, Diotrephes, he said, who, who love it to have the preeminence, he don't receive us. Go ahead, let's see what else he's doing. Verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. Uh-huh. Pratting against us with reminiscent words. See, so, so it didn't start with Moses, did it? Mm -hmm. It's always somebody want to be out of order, want to come against the truth which they really offend in God. Because if, if God is using somebody to preach the truth, you interfering with it. He said, wherefore, if, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth prating against us with malicious words. Why is he prating against them with malicious words? Because he got his own agenda. Go ahead. And not content therewith. And not content therewith. Go ahead. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbidden them that would, and cast them out of the church. See, he got his own agenda. That's why he told you what his agenda was at verse 9. He said, who loveth to have the preeminence. He want to have a preeminence. He want to be somebody. So that's why he coming up with stuff, prating against them with malicious work. But this is the New Testament. You're getting the same old thing. God got an order. John was one of the 12 disciples. You know he knew what he was talking about, but that didn't stop somebody from prating against them with malicious words, did it? Just like it didn't stop Moses talking to God face to face. It didn't stop people from coming against him. So you know we bound to have disorder. Somebody coming against the way it is. Romans uh, 13. But see, when you have people like that, they don't understand 
that the spirit that God is giving us is the spirit of servitude. That's what your mindset need to be. Romans 13 and verse 1. Romans 13 and verse 1. And that goes across the board. 13 and 1. Go ahead. Let every soul be subject unto the higher power. Uh huh. For there is no power but of God. See, he said, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. See, that's what you have to understand. Even John the Baptist tried to tell these people when they started to make him jealous of Jesus. They said, well, master, you know, because John the Baptist had a following. He had people that followed him, and he was telling them the truth even before Jesus really rose up. Then when Jesus rose up, John the Baptist, little follower dwindled. Most of them was with Jesus. So people tried to make him jealous. They said, and, and, and John the Baptist recognized Jesus, introduced him. And they said, Master, you know, the one you bear witness of, everybody following him. John the Baptist said, look, no man can't get nothing unless he, it came from heaven. So I ain't jealous of him. Just like he said, let every soul be subject to the higher power, for there's no power but of God. Look, if somebody is over you in anything, God didn't let it be that way. Because God is the one that set the order up, right? Mm -hmm. So let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of God. Go ahead. The powers that be are ordained of God. See, even the government and all of that, God allowed it to be that way. So we need to be humble enough to realize that that's God's order. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resists the power. And many do. Whosoever therefore resists the power, do what? Resists the ordinance of God. He said you resisting the ordinance of God. And that's across the board. That's what Korah and Dathan and Abiram, that's what they did with Moses. That's what this Deoff, De whatever his name is, De <laughs> the guy in the 3rd John. Yeah. <laughs> Him. That's what he did. And that's what you can do, period, even when it comes to civil authority. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. Go ahead. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. See, he's telling you don't, don't do it. But now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Because we're going to get into another area. But it's really the same thing. It's just recognizing that God got ordered everything. Because it's all about the word of God. 1 Corinthians 11. We've had this happen where, you know, sisters come to our congregation, they have a problem with covering their heads. We had that happen before. Not knowing that that's just recognizing the order. It's not even a, a put down, so to speak. It's, it's acknowledging the order that God has. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Go ahead. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Uh huh. Now I praise ye, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Okay, now Paul is telling the Corinthians, the more Gentile, to be followers of him. Because... Hey, he was the one that the Lord was using to bring them into the gospel. So he said he, he was an example for them. Be followers of me, even as I also am Christ. And I praise you, brethren, that you remember the, uh, me in all things and the ordinances that I delivered as I delivered them to you. Verse 3. But I will have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, uh -huh. and the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. See, now we dealt with a little bit of the church, how it's order in God's church. But we're going to get a little general with just general order, period. We saw how he set everything up with Israel. said the Jew first, then the Gentile. He set everything up with Moses in the wilderness. That didn't change when Jesus came. He had the same thing, 12 apostles. We saw that specific order. But now, even generally speaking, it's order from God through mankind as a whole. He said, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, 
And the head of the woman is the man. And what else? And the head of Christ is God. See, even Christ acknowledged the Father as his head. And under Christ is the man or the male. And under the male is the woman. That's the order that God set up. Go ahead, verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So now, it's something for the man to remember. A man shouldn't pray or prophesy and having his head covered because he dishonored his head. So it's not just for the woman here, but he's stressing the woman because that was the issue here. Verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Uh-huh. For that is, set, that is even all one as if she were shaven. See, but on the other hand, he's telling a woman that she should have her head covered praying or prophesying. That's why we ask women to have their head covered here when we have service, period. Because he said every woman that prayeth or prophesied having her head uncovered dishonoreth her head for that is even one. All one as if she was shaven. So when the women have their head covered here, we all are appearing as one, one image to God. And so it's really bringing a woman into the image of the male because her hair is something special. So she covering that, or it's just like she has shaved her hair off. It's the same thing. But go ahead, verse uh, 5 of no, 6. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Uh-huh. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, he being real specific about the woman being covered here. And it's amazing. I've seen some sisters come and read this, and they say, well, you know, they don't want to talk about the covering. They, they, they don't want to cover their head. So instead of covering their head, they say, well, it's telling me it shouldn't have long hair. So they want, to, they want to start talking about that. But that ain't even the issue here. The issue is clearly talking about a male not having a head covered and a female having her head covered when seeking the Lord. But I seen them just want to get down to this verse. We're going to get to it around verse 14 or so where it talk about a man having long hair. That's not even the issue. He used that as a point to say that a woman should cover her head. The issue wasn't a man, man having long hair, and it wasn't no law against having long hair. He was just making a point. Obviously, it couldn't have been no law if Samson had seven long locks we read about last year, and a Nazarite let his hair grow. He couldn't cut it when he made a vow. So the hair would get long. So it couldn't have been no law. He was just making another point, and he wasn't saying it was sin, just like he's not saying it's sin. And read that, uh, Seven, six verse again. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Now he said if the woman don't want to be covered, if she have a problem with that, let her be shown, which means to have her hair shaved, to be shaved. So he said let her be shown, right? Let her be shaven. Then he said something else behind that. Go ahead. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, he said let her be shorn or shaven, but he said if it's a shame. Now, the writer here don't care. It ain't, it ain't something wrong for a woman to shave her hair. But if she would be embarrassed, that show you when he used the word shame, he ain't saying it's a sin in God's eyesight. He just telling you what you think about it, the norm, how you feel about it. It's okay if the woman just shave her hair, right? So any sister don't want to be covered, you have the right to just go get that, that razor and cut it all off. He said, if the woman be not covered, let her be shown. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shown or shaven, let her be covered, he said, right? So, that, so he gave an option in that area, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, uh -huh. but the woman is the glory of the man. See, this is the order. God is at the top of the ladder, then Christ, then the male, then the female. That's the order. Then if you want to go farther to the kids, you know the kids come under that. But this is the order he given. And that's why a man don't cover his head. 
when seeking the Lord. Because he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man because the woman came from the man, which he going to say, verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, uh, but the woman of the man. See, that's the way it is. The man is not of the woman, but the woman came from the man. See, but you have a lot of people, men and women now, that don't think it should be any order in this regard. But go ahead, verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Okay, so that's, that's real clear. That was the specific reason for being created. The woman was created for the man, not the other way around. Go ahead. For this cause off the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. See, so this is helping the woman. It's not putting the woman down. It's helping the woman. She's going to have power because she's not in the direct image of God. And God is going to recognize that she's coming up to speed with a, with a head cover. So that's power. Against these evil spirits out here. That's the angels he's talking about. That's why she needs some power because of these evil angels. That will help her. Whereas you get a woman that's stubborn and, and don't want to be obedient and out of order, God will allow them evil angels to affect her. And they have everything all twisted up. Even though she could be listening to the truth. She could be hearing the truth, but by the time she's hearing it, it's something altogether different. She real confused. So he said, for this cause off the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Go ahead, verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. See, but he said, nevertheless, hey, the woman, it ain't like the woman is unnecessary and unneeded. Obviously, she needed. So it ain't something for the man to get out of his place and act as if the woman is not needed. This is just the order. Because if the man don't do what he's supposed to do, he's going to have to answer to God. And that's something for the woman to remember too, not to get out of her place. Because he's going to answer to God. He said, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Verse 12. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. Uh -huh. But all things of God. See, so they together. But go ahead. Judging yourselves. It is comely that a woman praying to God uncovered. He, now, he's still talking about the woman praying unco uncovered. This is the whole gist of it right here. He said, now, judging yourselves. Is it comely? Is it good that a woman praying to God uncovered? And the answer is no. He's already made that clear. But then he says, say this, and I've seen people just want to read this 14th verse. Well, you talking about a woman covering her head, but you got long hair. That's why I cut my lock. No, that ain't the reason. <laughs> but people were saying that. They say that. So, like that give a woman a reason not to cover her head. That still don't change the fact. Go ahead, read verse 14. This is what they like. Go ahead. Doth not even nature itself teach you? That if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? See, now he's using that to answer verse 13, though. That's his whole point of the matter, to answer verse 13. Judging yourself, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? The answer is no. Because he lets you know that the woman's hair is specially given to her. So she need to cover it up when approaching the Lord. Then he said, doth not nature... Itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame. See, that ain't saying it's a sin, just like he said, if it be a shame for a woman to shave her hair, be covered. He didn't care whether she shaved her head or not, though. It wasn't wrong for her to shave it, but if it's a shame to her, if, that's, if that'll make her feel bad in society, then just cover your head. Well, that's the same thing here. Nature, he said, teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame. And that's like I said I think last week or whatever, that's the way I felt about having a, a, a perm. I used to, you know, getting your butter whipped. But that's the way I felt. I felt like that's a shame. I ain't doing it. But some brothers did it. I wasn't going. So, but that's the way I felt. Not that it was a sin for them to do it either. Some brothers, I think one brother still got one of them preachers. What's his name? In New York, whatever he is. He still, he ain't came out of the 70s. Sharpton. I guess that's what he got. I don't know. Maybe he got a wig. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, let's go to uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 
Ephesians 5, and we're going to try to wrap it up. Pick it up at verse 20. But all of this is showing you that this is, this is divine order that God has laid out. It ain't nothing that we're trying to concoct. Ephesians 5 and verse 20. Ephesians 5 and verse 20. And that's why everything is out of order, because we don't want to follow God's order. Men or women. 5 and 20, go ahead. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Ephesians 5. Is that mm -hmm. it? Mm-hmm. In verse 20. Mm-hmm. It didn't sound right, but go ahead. Ephesians 5 and 20. Okay, go ahead. I, I started at the wrong. I meant 21, but go ahead. 21. Okay. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, uh -huh. in the fear of God. Uh -huh. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So again, he's breaking down the order. They go all. For the husband is the head of the wife. Just like we just read in 1 Corinthians. Go ahead. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Uh-huh. And he is the savior of the body. See, this is in line with the way Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Go ahead, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. See, this is what the Bible is saying. But see, a lot of people in society don't believe this should still be the case. He said, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Go ahead, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See, and the husband has his responsibility to love and provide for his wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, let's go to uh, Ephesians 6 now. Ephesians 6. But again, it would be easy for everybody to do their part if everybody has the mindset of just being a servant. That's why the title is Order in the Body of Servants. We all here, men and women, ministers and people that's helping in the ministry, we all here to serve. Ephesians 6 and 1, go ahead. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh-huh. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. See, so even for, it's, it's order all the way down to the children. Obey your parents in the Lord, this is right. Honor your mother and fa father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, because the Lord going to reward you one way or another. Verse, verse 3. That it may be well with thee, mm -hmm. and thou mayest live long on the earth. Uh -huh. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, uh -huh. but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, so now just because you are over somebody in any capacity, you shouldn't provoke them to wrath by doing wrong. You can't do wrong to somebody and then expect, you know, even though they don't need to get out of place, but you causing the problem in the first place. So if you provoke somebody, then you're part of the problem. And that go, that go with anybody. But go ahead, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Uh-huh. With fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. See, now he says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. He didn't say rise up against them. He said, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ, verse 6. Not with thy service as men pleasers. See, not when they looking, you know, because sometimes people have jobs and they under somebody. They only do it when they looking. He said, not with our service as men pleasers, but go ahead. But as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Uh-huh. With good do with good will doing service as the as to the Lord and not to men. See, notice he talks about with 
with goodwill doing service, because that's what it's about. It's about being a servant, even if you're not under nobody physically like that, even if you're just serving the Lord. But go ahead. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Uh huh. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing and threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Neither is there respect of persons with him. See, because everybody got somebody over them. And that's what everybody should remember. That's why even if somebody is out of order, we don't have to rise up and be out of order. Like I tell sisters all the time, even if their husband had done something wrong, that don't get them the right to rise up and just get out of order. Because now you got yourself a whooping coming too. Whereas, hey, he could have just got straightened out by God. But now that ain't going to make it no better. But now go to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14, and we're going to pick it up at verse 26. First Corinthians 14 and verse 26. Okay, go ahead. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have a psalm, have the doctrine, have the tongue, have the revelation, had an interpretation. Mm -hmm. Let all things be done unto edifying. See, now he had to get on these people, the Corinthians, about this because everything was out of order. Everything was out of order. He said, how is it, brethren, that when you come together, everybody, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation. See, everybody trying to show what they know, and I've seen that over and over again. Everybody trying to put themselves forward. It, it ain't about trying to help somebody. That's like I tell brothers all the time. Even when you're talking to somebody on an individual level, it, it's not what you want to tell them. It's what they need to hear. Sometimes we be thinking, well, I want to tell them this and I want to tell it, it ain't even about that. That's why some people say, well, what should I tell them? What should, what should I start off with? I don't know. Whatever they need. Whatever they need. That's what has to be figured out. That's what the goal need to be. See what they need, where they need help at. Not just what you want to preach or say to them. How is it, brethren, that when you come together, every one of you hath the psalm, hath the doctrine, hath the tongue, hath the revelation, hath the interpretation. Let all things be done to edifying. You trying to help somebody else. Not show what you know. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, uh -huh. and that by course, mm -hmm. and, let no one, and let one interpret. See, he had to give some order to this speaking in tongues. And now they done went crazy with it, and they, ain't, they don't even know how to do it. And they done went crazy with it. Obviously, they're not listening to this, because if they listen to this, they wouldn't be doing it, and don't nobody know what they're talking about. Verse 28. But if there be no interpret. Interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. See, I wonder what would happen if you go in there and they speak. You stand up and read that. <laughs> he said, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. I bet you it wouldn't go silent, though. You could try. One time I tried to say something at one of them real noisy churches. I just said a little something, boy. They regrouped on me, though. After I got down, they said, wait a minute now. <laughs> <laughs> we got to take a station ID. They were talking about me, too. They said, we got to take a station identification and, re you know, remind ourselves what we about up in here because he tried to throw us off. So they weren't listening. <laughs> but you can try it yourself. Keep silence in the church. All that tongue babbling should cease right away, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. And let him speak. But people don't care about the order that God got set. They care about what makes them feel good. 
or look good. Skip down to verse 32 and read that. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Uh-huh. For God is not the author of confusion, uh -huh. but of peace. 